guest speaker for the evening is um, Rusty Chinnis, who is uh, chairman of Suncoast Waterkeepers. And he's going to give us um, an update on the fish farm and on some of the local water projects for, that the water keepers are involved in. Rusty has been a longtime resident of Longboat Key, um, since over four decades. That's a while. And he's a fisherman, a photographer, a writer, a fly casting instructor. I may have some business for you. And has been a clean water advocate for over 30 years. He was a founding member of the Siesta Key, the Sister Keys Conservancy, Sarasota Bay Watch, and served as president of the Florida Outdoor Writers Association. Rusty joined Suncoast Waterkeeper because, in his words, they are doing the critical work to hold municipalities and elected officials accountable under the Clean Water Act. That sounds like a great, a great a thing to be doing. So, Rusty, we're anxious to hear what you have to tell us. Uh, well, thank you for having me tonight, and thank you for your interest in Suncoast Waterkeeper. Um, just another thing, actually, I didn't mention in my um, in my bio there. I was also a building contractor on Longbow Key for thirty five years. Oh. I did mostly remodeling work, but um, it really gave me two sides. I mean, being a fisherman and seeing the water, being a um, a building contractor and seeing what would happen when we'd have big red tides and how it would affect my business was very much it was very illuminating. I um, mean, I try to use that now to try to get across to just everybody the importance of our clean water and uh, especially to this area where, you know, everything people come here because of the uh, habitat that we have. And um, it's the reason that uh, the economy is as strong as it is around here. So um, I really appreciate that. I mean, we operate because of people like you, people who care, people who get involved. So thank you for having me. Oops. Yep. So I just wanted to, yeah, just briefly, um, we have been operating as an all-volunteer board for a long time. I've only been on the actual, the board of Suncoast Waterkeeper for maybe almost two years now. Um, I was originally one of the founders of Sarasota Baywatch, uh, which we formed in 2007 after we had a really bad red tide here to try to get more people involved in the health of the bay because how we thought how important it was. Um, and I'm still, I'm still really a big supporter of, um, of uh, Sarasota Baywatch, but I realized that, in, in order, and we have big uh, program to put clams in Sarasota Bay and to do, we do all kinds of other, had done all kinds of other things, outreach and education, but it became very clear to me over the years that if we don't get the water right, if we don't quit putting the nutrients in the water, if we don't do that, then you can't put enough clams in the water to, uh, to help the bay. So I thought that Suncoast Waterkeeper was doing the critical work that needed to be done. Uh, that's why I joined. And like I said, we were an all-volunteer board for a very long time. And just recently, we, we hired Abby Tyrna uh, as our executive director and a waterkeeper. And she's worked with Sarasota County for quite a few years. She is very, very, uh, and at the University of Florida, and she um, basically knows water and all. It's been a, a very great uh, help to us and really have, helping us to expand our, our, our mission and, and get more things accomplished here. So we're very glad to have her on board. Um, basically the mission, as you can read it here of Suncoast Waterkeeper is basically to protect and restore the Florida Suncoast waters for the benefit of all through litigation, advocacy, environmental monitoring and community engagement. Uh, and Sunco's Waterkeeper had always been uh, known for the litigation. And, you know, litigation is what makes this organization effective. What I've tried to do is, is, um, as the, the chair and as a board member here is to also really um, the, the community engagement and environmental monitoring to reach out to these people and say, hey, there's an issue. Uh, we know there's an issue. We want to help you with this. What we can, can we do to help you resolve these issues? but always keeping that litigation in our back pocket. That's the strength that we have is that people know that if, if we don't get uh, engagement from them, that we are not, uh, we will file suit if necessary. Um, so right now, uh, and as far as the litigation goes, we have had over the years, seven lawsuits settled. 
two that are still in court. One actually is the Piney Point, um, which we are suing because we think they have uh, an inadequate closure plan. Uh, the other one is the fish farm, and that actually that litigation has not been filed, but we it'll be happening at any time now. Um, over this period of time, the Suncoast Waterkeeper has been here. Over one trillion gallons of polluted water has stopped being dumped in the Sarasota Bay. And through our litigation, uh, and a lot of this is that we don't actually have to litigate; we just threaten litigation, and people actually come into compliance because they don't want to litigate. There's also been over 200, almost a quarter of a million dollars of beneficial environmental projects that have been initiated in the Sarasota Bay watershed. Um, one of the main things that we do is the water quality monitoring. Um, we, try to re we try to fill in gaps. Um, the, the health department monitors waters, but they only monitor waters along the beaches. We know that people use the water, they use the bays, um, and so we try to go and monitor uh, areas where are, there, there are no monitor, there's no monitoring going on to try to make sure that people know that the water is safe uh, to swim in, um, to paddleboard and to fish in. Um, and uh, we have a couple of different things that we do. Um, and one of them is, and I think you can go to the next slide here. Um, uh, in our water quality monitoring, we do a bacterial monitoring. And what do we do is we, we monitor for enterococci. And enterococci is a, a bacteria that's in the gut of humans. And yeah, that way, if there's any fecal matter in the water, um, it will as an indicator of the fact that, and it, unfortunately you can't actually narrow it down to human in fact, but it's basically if these bacteria in the water, it's not a good idea to be in the water if they're at high levels. So we monitor that. And you can see here on some of the things here, especially in this time of the year when the waters are warm, we're getting some, uh, air, some, some severe readings all over the bay. And, and those you can are find the, these online. Yeah, those are the red dots too, Russ. Correct, right? the red dots. Yeah. You can see the green dot that's there is near the pass. You know, and yeah. Obviously you have better flushing from the Gulf of Mexico. So it's more likely to be better water quality near the passes. Um, a big part of what we do is advocacy. Um, we have uh, one of the things we've done doing is we sign on to uh, other initiatives like one to uh, help to protect the manatees by improving uh, boater safety. Uh, and it's really interesting. The fact is like 130 boats for every manatee in the, in the state of Florida. And I know you island people who live on the island, you probably see manatees in the water when you're swimming or maybe when you're in a boat or on the bridges or stuff. And if you're like me, and I've lived on the island here for almost 40, about 40 years, and you don't, it's hard, you hardly ever see a manatee that doesn't have a prop scar on it. One, one of the other things that we do too is now we're really getting strong about is, mangri, is mangroves the, the, to monitor mangrove trimming. Uh, you're lucky in Sarasota County because Sarasota County has adopted um, the enforcement of Manatee rules and regulations from the state. Manatee County has not, and there's a lot of very questionable mangrove trimming going on, one of which we've been following very closely um, and monitoring is one over by the Aqua uh, development on, on Sarasota Bay. Uh, this is just a picture of some of the debris that we went over. We went over, took pictures of it. We found it's just highly uh, illegal to, uh, and, and, uh, to have this size of, uh, of trimmings and all. So that's another thing with the advocacy. Uh, and we try to get the word out to the people that these same kinds of things going on and they're important. Uh, community engagement, once again, we are doing the, uh, we have over 200 letters in, uh, generated from our um, social media campaign to protect the mangroves uh, that were delivered to the Manatee County Board of County Commissioners. Um, and also we're getting the word out on the, um, the lingbia blooms and uh, Abby is speaking, you know, here is just a picture where she was on the news talking about that. Um, I'm not sure how much you have had that problem over in, um, on Siesta Key. Um, but one of the things worth mentioning now is that Dave Tomasco, who is the executive director of the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, has pointed out that traditionally the area around Siesta Key, Philippine Creek and all has been the one that had the most problems. Now we're seeing more serious problems in the North Bay. Um, and it's interesting to note that one of the actions uh, that Suncoast 
Texas Waterkeeper took was against the Sarasota County who had been dumping billions of gallons of partially treated wastewater into Philippi Creek, which had been affected. Now that has been stopped and that's made, it's already making a big difference in the Bay there. So part of our community engagement. Okay, uh, we are just in the process of instituting a, a, a program we're calling Eyes on the Sun Coast. Um, and we engage, try to engage the public through three different ones, a, 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 an app called the Water Reporter, which you see all the way on the right here. Anybody that's interested in that, it's an app um, that there's a group of, um, uh, of uh, AI um, and um, other tech techies that created this group to try to assist um, environmental groups with technology. And they've created this water reporter and we're in the process of, uh, it's actually an app that you can put on your phone. You can go around if you see like with a mangrove trimming or if you see a, um, you know, an algae bloom, a fish kill, you can actually take a picture, you can pinpoint it on the map and make a comment. And it creates a database that we can then use to show elected officials where the problems are and the severity of the problems. We're also posting on social media. Um, on, we've been doing a um, on eyes on the water, and you can see some of these if you go to, to, our, to our website, which is suncoastwaterkeeper.org. Uh, we call we had to call it eyes on the water. We're now making it uh, eyes on the sun coast. It's under development, but we try to. I uh, have some guides out there, fishing guides who send me video clips, uh, and then I try to craft those because these are guys that are on the water sometimes over 200 days a year. And they're the ones that, well, what I think are, I call my first responders. They're the first ones to see these sorts of things. And then we're also through the, uh, through our website, making sure that people know about uh, the water quality, um, uh, monitoring issues like Piney Point, and the, those kinds of things that the public really needs to be aware of. Um, what we have, we, we have one major fundraiser every year um, besides the grants that we get from foundations all, and this is called Brunch for the Bay. Uh, it's held at the Braden and Yacht Club. It'll be this year at, on October 15th. Um, at, uh, we have a presentation by our founder, Justin Bloom, who I'm kind of taking the place of tonight because he's a busy guy. Um, we have uh, Nick Castillo, who is a PhD candidate and works for um, the um, Tarpon and Bonefish Trust. And he's recently done a study of pharmaceutical drugs that are appearing in fish. He'll be there to speak about this. Um, John Bowden, uh, he's a professor at the University of Florida. He's been studying the PFA, PFOS, the, the forever chemicals right. that are just really being put, you, you just starting to hear about them now, but they're very, very concerning. Um, and uh, so uh, if any of you are interested, I, I highly recommend it. it's a great time. It's a brunch. Um, it's like a noontime brunch and uh, it's very well attended and it sells out fairly quickly. But we'd love to have you there to join us. And it's very informative. And of course, you meet a lot of like minded people there. October, what was it, October 15th? Yep, yes, definitely. October 15th. Uh -huh. And you can go to the Suncoast Waterkeeper website dot, and you'll sign a link there to sign to sign up for it. And we're always looking for members um, and uh, our membership, you know, it, it not only helps to have the memberships and a continuing uh, uh, base of, of people who donate to the organization for all these things that I've just presented here that we do. And uh, so we'd love to have new members um, and you can go to our website to learn more about Suncoast Waterkeeper and the ways you can get involved and can help us. So um, with that, um, I'll just kind of open it up for any questions anybody has. Uh, Mike, you want to go first? Yeah, hey Rusty, it's Mike Holden, how are you? Hey, good Mike. Good, good. I have a question speaking of North Bay is um, maybe within the last year Longboat has added three rock wall jennies at the very north tip of beer can. And since yeah. then, it's eroded a major portion of it and it's happening very, very quickly. And I kind of think, it kind of seems like that island there is the barrier island for Jewfish estuary, you know, with all the seagrass and stuff. So I'm really concerned if those jetties remain, what will happen to the, where you put the clams and everything else behind it, you know? 
You know, that's a really interesting subject, Mike, because I've been here on Lombok for a very long time, long enough to see about three or four projects just like this that have been claimed to be the answer, right? This is going to do it. This is going to control it. And no nothing really works. Uh, I mean, these are barrier islands. Basically, these are sandbars that by and natural are supposed to shift. I asked that very same question because I live in the village in the very north end. And I basically ride my bike almost every day up to Longboat Pass to watch the sunset. So I see it and I've got pictures of this erosion. And I actually asked them specifically about this question. And they said that they had actually planned on this erosion happening, right? So they actually put a certain amount of sand. Uh, if you are familiar with Longboat Pass, there's been a huge amount of sand that over the years has come in the pass and, and, and actually closed off that little bayou in there behind Beer Can Island. So um, I don't know how to answer that question, Mike, except to say that, um, you know, probably we shouldn't have, we shouldn't be, be on these islands, which is interesting to say, because I've lived on it and I, and I don't plan on moving, but um, it's just, um, and, the, and I think one of the most important things that we could probably do is when they do the beach renourishments to somehow control when they do the beach renourishment around the passes. Because when they do the beach immersion actively around the passes on an incoming tide, huge amounts of that sediment is swept into the bay and deposited on the seagrass beds. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, they said the other kind of thing I found alarming, they used uh, like public funds to create more public beach. Is, was what, so the public paid for those rock jetties that are actually eroding it. So it's really bizarre to me. And I, I believe it's to cut off the motors from Longboat and the other sound and noise. Yeah, I mean, once again, that's uh, it's just such a convoluted thing. Um, and uh, I mean, that will claim that the rock jetties that were, they expected there, this is what you'll hear if you ask them that question, they, they expected it to erode the rock jetties, even though they're becoming exposed, but actually keep more sand from coming around there than not. Uh, I'm just saying that over almost 40 years, I've seen like four or five of these projects that were, you know, going to solve the problem. And I don't think there is such a solution. So. Uh, I'm not sure that an answered the question, but. <laughs> um, we have a couple in the room that have questions. Go ahead. Okay. My question is about the speed of the boats. Um, on Sarasota Bay, and what is being done about the missing signs that used to say no wait, like where the bayous come into Sarasota Bay? We've been talking and talking about that, and I keep asking Officer Dixon when he comes by on his, his uh, police boat, and he has said to be sure I send him, which I've been doing, pictures of manatees, because he said that's one thing that maybe could persuade them to put the signs back up. But apparently somebody has determined that it doesn't matter how fast people go past these fires. And we've got power borders and kayakers, in addition, of course, to the manatees and the dolphins. And it really is a very, very dangerous situation and driven by particularly the jet skis. Yeah, uh, well, you know, the, the short answer to that is that is an enforcement issue. And this has been a problem as long as I've been here. And that started out, I was involved with fisheries, man, fisheries way early back in the, uh, in the early 90s, late 80s. Um, and that you have all these rules and regulations, but there's no enforcement of them. So, uh, and, you know, as you well know, human nature, there's a lot of people, if you have a rule on that, they'll follow it. Um, and there's a lot of people that won't, no matter what. But uh, that's the, and, and that the enforcement's an issue with the compliance for the wastewater, with the, the signs, uh, wakes, everything. We as the citizens have to elect people who will make sure that these things are enacted. That, that's what I see as the biggest issue. One of the biggest issues is um, and vote, and voting the right people into office. John. Rusty, this is John Morton with Siesta Sand Newspaper. Hey, John. Hello, do you have a viewpoint on the Midnight Pass saga? Um, not really, I've, I'm pretty well, you know, being on the north end of Longboat, I know about it obviously over the years. Um, and um, 
you, you know, there's both sides to that story. I mean, there's the side of the story that if you open it up, you know, that it'll create better flushing in little Sarasota Bay, um, which is probably true. Um, and then it's the matter of can you keep it open? Um, and because obviously it's been opened a couple of times. And, you know, if they open it up, then uh, in order to keep it open, are they going to put rock jetties to keep it open? And then you'll end up with the same issues Mike's talking about with the jetties and stuff. So, you know, at this point in time, um, you know, I'm, I'm really don't, <laughs> it's a, it's a tough one. Thank you. If you want to speak back on that a little bit. Go ahead, Mike. So, um, what we, we decided we brought in a lot of engineers and, and started from scratch. Why did it close in the first place? Why, meaning why did it start shifting to the north and then eventually close? And it was due to the spoils of the intercoastal filling in the northern channel. So basically you have two diverging currents coming from the south and the north, and that's what kept it open and it created shoals and an ebb delta, and it kept it naturally open. But when the northern channel lost, let's say pressure, then it caused the past to start shifting. So now we're looking at something um, way, way less aggressive than it was proposed in the 80s, no rock jetties, nothing like that. Basically clean out um, the Northern channel and a little bit of the Southern channel so it can have a natural diverging currents and keep it open naturally, which in turn should stop the erosion to Turtle Beach, which is really hot sand, a lot of female turtles, that kind of thing. So this, it could be a really, really good thing so far if we do it the right way not anything aggressive with jetties and stuff like that. Any other questions? Rusty, I want to go back to the one question about the um, fish farm. You, yes. had, you had mentioned you, you're getting, you think there'll be some, um, uh, some legal, something legal filed pretty soon uh, on, in that area. Uh, again, is this again in the um, area of trying to uh, delay it or was what was actually going on at this point? So the issue basically from our point of view, we're not really, we're, we, we don't, we're not taking a stand against agriculture. Right. We just believe that this, um, this particular project, now it's just a demonstration project, but if this is approved, they could be coming up, they could be popping up everywhere along the coast. We believe that, they're, that they need to do a more rigorous scientific, a full environmental impact study on this, which they're not doing. And that is our main concern about this. We're worried about you know, the possibility of you know, uh, the, the things that uh, are problems with agriculture, um, whether it's the, you know, the, 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 um, the waste from the fish themselves, any antibiotics and things that might be there, the potential to maybe in, help initiate a red tide event, um, those sorts of things. So uh, until there's like a full, really rigorous environmental study, um, we plan on with a group of, uh, quite a group of, uh, we're just one of the people that are signing on to a much larger um, case. Okay. That's what I wanted to get clear. Thank yes. you. I did have a question about the, um, the your monitoring of water uh, uh -huh. plays and is there a link on your website where we can view that monitoring information or? There is. Okay. There okay. is. Uh, um, okay. Yes, you can go to, and it's, um, it's called the swim guide. Swim guide, okay. Yes. And uh, we, uh, we, we, we sample, um, we sample uh, every other week. Uh, it'll show you all the different places that we do sample. It'll show you the, um, the results of those samples and, and grade it um, by whether it's safe or not to swim there. So, yes. Okay. And um, as far as the water reporter application, um, yeah. can that be downloaded from your site or do you go to like Play Store or how do you get Yeah, the App Store, if you, it would be the Play Store if you have a Google okay. device. It would be okay. the Apple App Store if you have an Apple device. You can download it from there. Just type in, uh, in the App Store uh, Water Reporter. Okay. Okay. And One then, questions. Rusty, I had a few. Um, I work uh, on the restoration for the Grand Canal. What we're trying to do is create habitat to bring 
um, in juvenile fish, build, build a habitat that replenishes our juvenile uh, fish population. Along with that, we've been using some uh, YSI equipment to do water sampling in our area. So we do have statistics about you know, depth and uh, I would say temperature, oxygen, things like that, that we're, we're actually yep. looking at. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we've done is done some chemical testing and you had mentioned forever chemicals. We have, yes. uh, we have some issues with some of the spraying on the lawns Okay, the chemicals they're using on the spraying of the lawns. So yes. this is, a, a, I know that that's one of the things you're looking at, but I wanted to point that out. This is a problem that is in our neighborhoods that most of the homeowners aren't aware of. It, that it may not bother their pets, but what's happening is it's rolling into the water and it's, it's com coming into our fish and the rest of our environment. So, yeah, you're very, you're right about that. And that's part of the outreach and education. Uh, there's so many like factors that are affecting our water quality and it might be uh, fertilizing, you know, there's a fertilizer ban, uh, but it's not really, I don't know how well it's enforced there. In Manatee County, it's not enforced very well. I actually went into one of the local stores one time and asked for a bag of fertilizer and asked the guy in there, is there any kind of rules? And he goes, not that I know of. <laughs> So, uh, and then there's like uh, making sure that people aren't like mowing their grass and blowing grass clippings into the canal because that's a source of nitrogen, not cleaning up after dogs. I mean, it's just so many factors that are affecting our water quality. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much.